Welcome to the weekly service from the Elim Church in the Holm Valley. We're delighted that you've joined us tonight here live and uh, online. We pray that tonight that you will be blessed, that you will be encouraged, that you will be lifted up and that you'll go home having heard from God and you'll take something home that's going to help you to grow and be fruitful for him. Amen? Amen. Amen. And we continue to pray for other people that are close to us, our loved ones, our friends, those that are special to us, who are suffering at this time, whether it be body, mind, or some other area in their lives where they're facing challenges. Father, I pray that they would know you as the answer to it all. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Before I forget, um, someone has said to me that they want to get baptised. Hallelujah. So we're going to get the baptistry. I've already, already sorted it out that we can borrow the baptistry from the Huddersfield Church. We're going to sit the baptistry over here. So I'd like it for, to be more than one person. Eh? So if anybody who hasn't yet been baptised and wants to be baptised, uh, let's set a date. Amen. Praise God. Go. Good evening. I'm going to read several scriptures tonight to see if you can spot a common theme. Okay. Some of them are from the Amplified Classic, other translations, but particularly from the Amplified Classic. For God himself has said, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake you, nor let you down. Relax my hold on you. Assuredly not. That was Hebrews 13.5. The next verse, Hebrews 13, 6. So we take comfort and are encouraged and confidently and boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be seized with alarm. I will not fear or dread or be terrified. Deuteronomy 31, 8. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. Isaiah 41, 10. Do not fear anything, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Be assured, I will help you. I will certainly take hold of you with my righteous right hand, a hand of justice, a hand of power, of victory, and of salvation. Psalm 94, 14. For the Lord will not reject his people. He will never forsake his inheritance. And Hebrews 4, 16. Let us fearlessly and confidently and boldly Draw near to the throne of grace, the throne of God's unmerited favour to us sinners, that we may receive mercy for our failures and find grace to help in good time for every need, appropriate help and well-timed help coming just when we need it. Hallelujah. Did you spot the common theme? We do not need to fear. God will never fail us. He will not let us down. He will not abandon us. He has us covered. Amen. Amen. Let's worship him.
Lord, we thank you that you are so good. Everything you do for us is filled with your love and with your grace and with your compassion. Lord, we thank you that we can be absolutely certain that you won't leave us, you won't forget about us, you won't suddenly turn your back on us because you have promised you will not and you don't lie. We can trust your every word. And so we can come in confidence and with boldness right into your presence and receive that help that we need just when we need it because you will not let us down. You are so good. Hallelujah. Perhaps one or two of you would just like to give your own prayers of thanksgiving to him right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you are forever working in each of our lives. Mm. Thank you, Lord, that you, you're like that stick of rock that where the words go all the way through the middle. You have good all the way through, and not good as we know it in the world. Well, that was good, mm-hmm. but good.
whatever you're going through tonight, know that he is Lord and that he is with you. He has promised never to leave you nor forsake you. Even though you may not feel that he is there, maybe you're not even aware that God is there, but he is. Hallelujah. Because he has promised never to leave you nor forsake you. Amen. 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 Praise God. Please take your seat if you haven't already done so. So, um, a bit, was, a bit nearer, uh, yeah. nearer to here. Okay. Yeah. I was feeling quite low and um, I just had more of an encounter with God. I had an encounter with God. Yeah. So I was feeling that I really needed Jesus. And, and one day, the day before, I'd been feeling really low, like, like he seemed really far away. Yeah. And the day after, I, I thought, right, I'm going to sit down and spend time with Jesus. Do you know, I'm just going to sit, spend time with him a little yeah. bit of time. So I just sat down and um, I just said the word Jesus. And straight away, I saw a vision and it was Jesus walking towards me. It was like a cartoon, but not a cartoon, but like it was on telly or something like that. And he was walking towards me and I was like looking straight at him. And I knew it was Jesus because he looked like the way that I thought he looked, you know, like in white and he had um, hair and beard and everything. And I knew it was Jesus, I didn't have to say it was Jesus. And he was coming towards me and I thought it was coming to me. And all of a sudden, out of my peripheral vi vi vision, a little girl, um, about four or five, came from the side and ran towards Jesus and he put his hand out to her. And I knew without him saying anything or me saying anything that that was me as a little girl. Yeah. And I just needed my father right then. And I ran to him, the, the little girl ran to him and took his hand and they walked away together. But mm. I'd just been asking to, you know, like I, I feel alone and, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. And I, need, I didn't have any peace and that kind of thing. And Jesus just came. But he took the little girl, he didn't take me. I was like, all oh, right, I thought yeah. you were coming to me. Yeah. yeah, but I think from what, we, what I understood from that, uh, Danielle, was yeah. that, that God took your hand when you were a little child. Yeah. And that he has been with you all that time. Yeah. yeah. And he was just reassuring you of his presence. Yeah. And I, I thought that was a sort of a good illustration or just a good reminder to us that God is, has been with us over the years, is with us over the years. Sometimes we don't recognize it. And, you know, God gave you that sort of mm. insight that he's been with you all this time, leading you, taking you by the hand. Even when I didn't feel like he was there. Amen. Like he felt really... Like it felt really distant. Yeah. And he just had to come and get me because I was kind of like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where I'm going. Yeah. You know? yeah. And then he came and he came and got me. It was like he was getting me from school. Yeah. And it was just like, oh, and I, now yeah. I just. Yeah. Like, you know, see him. And it's a lovely picture of the Father's love for us as well. Mm -hmm. So be encouraged about that. Thank you. Be blessed. Thank you. Give her a clap. Amen. Praise God. Thank you. Sorry for putting you on that, uh, on you like that at the last minute, but amen. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Um, just before I launch into my message, uh, just to say that the, the software that I do the video editing with now means that we can have embedded subtitles uh, in, in, the, in the video. So if you're watching online and you would prefer to have embedded subtitles along the bottom, just as they are coming across the screen on the bottom right now, let me know and I'll include them um, just for you. All right. Praise God. Amen. All right. So you remember how last week Jesus calmed the storm on the lake because of the way that Jesus addressed the storm. Um, in the same way that he had rebuked a demon previously, we said that most commentators believe that the storm was caused by Satan. We know that from John 10.10 10, that the enemy comes to steal, kill and destroy. So at the end of Mark, for the very, at the very least, Satan was trying to, to, to destroy the faith of the disciples and to destroy and steal the seed of faith that had been received with gladness. When Satan comes against us, he's wanting to destroy, our, to destroy our faith and rob us of the blessing that is rightfully ours. We have to stand up and exercise faith 
in Jesus' name, we stand up in faith, not flop or fall apart in fear. Now, when Satan sees us as a threat to his authority, he will come strongly against us as that old ditty, that old saying that says, if Satan has not bumped into you, it's because you're walking in the same direction. And some of the commentators believe that there was, on the, there was the storm on the lake at the end of chapter four because of what was about to happen in chapter five. The enemy did not want Jesus to set legion free, which we're just gonna look at in, in one moment's time. Uh, Gadara occupied a high position on the east coast of Galilee. And from it, you could oversee the lake and see every boat that was approaching. Satan and his demons would have seen Jesus approaching and in fear, they would have reacted and they would have caused the storm because they wanted to prevent Jesus from ministering to Legion and setting him free. We're gonna look at our text today uh, from Mark chapter five. Um, there are lots of little take homes tonight, perhaps rather than one big take home, lots of little things that we can take note of uh, in this passage. There's quite a lot of theology. There's quite a lot of stuff that we could mention from this. So we've got lots of little things to say. Hopefully you'll take one of these home, uh, one of the take homes home uh, as meaningful to you and help you grow in your walk with the Lord. So here it is from Mark 5. Then they came to the other side of the sea to the country of Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tomb, a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he'd been bound with shackles and chains. He'd often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. So we see here a man who is helpless and hopeless, depraved and desperate, a man who was living amongst the dead. And it reminds me of this, of this is almost a picture of how we were before we knew Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour. Now, let me say, uh, Underlined here, I'm not suggesting that before we were believers that we were all full with demons, but at least, at the very least, we could say that we were under the influence of Satan. Ephesians uh, 2, when we looked at that the other um, month, reminded us that we once walked in darkness according to the flesh, according to the enemy. Right, here it comes. Um, here it is, Ephesians 2, 2 from um, the New Living Translation. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. The lost sinner has no desire to be living around those who are alive in Christ. The lost sinner walks in darkness, lives in darkness, walks amongst the dead, as Ephesians 2 describes it in a spiritual sense. Death and works of deadness are all they care about. He is a man out of control. Others had tried to intervene in his life, to, but to no avail. People had tried to apply a solution to his problem, but nothing worked. They tried to tame him by chaining him up, but he broke the chains. Nothing worked. And again, it reminds me of how the world tries to sort out um, man's problems. When the answer is Jesus, they try to tame or to address man's problems in a different way. People try prisons, potions, pills, psychology in an attempt to tame their hopelessness and helplessness, but it doesn't make any meaningful difference. Tim Keller, the American preacher, he says something like this. In the West, intelligent people have said all evil, whether we're talking about selfishness or violence on an individual level, or if we're talking about war or crime or poverty or racism or on a corporate level, can be reduced, analyzed, understood and dealt with because it has human roots. 
i.e. it is not a spiritual problem. Some people would take more of a psychological approach. They would say the reason there's violence and selfishness in people is that we have psychological problems. We weren't loved properly. We had an, he, we had an inadequate family background and so forth. We deal with evil through secular counselling. Some people take a more sociological view. This is still Tim Keller. They say racism and poverty, for example, are the result of an unjust social system. Therefore, it can be dealt through, with through education and social policy programs. So this is how the world addresses things, through, through secular psychology, through counselling, through, through programs, through education, through, by throwing loads of money at something. Other people would say, no, a lot of the problems we have are only physiological. They're the results of evolutionary biology and natural selection. They're, survi they're the survival of the fittest, and we have to deal with it. Really, through chemicals, um, it's chemistry uh, that makes us aggressive. It's chemistry that does this sort of things. We have to deal with it through drugs, by medicating people. That's the way that we deal with these issues. But hey, I don't know whether you've noticed out there in the world now, that we've tried counselling, we've tried secular counselling, we've tried social programmes, we've tried all kinds of medication to try and help people, but it's not worked. We don't need these things. What we need is Jesus. Jesus is the answer. Uh, Gal and I have quite a lot of people that, that come through our home from time to time, just turning out of the blue, knocking on the door, people that know us and, and, and often they pour their hearts out to us and that's okay, that's what we're there for. And I remember on this occasion, this person coming into our, our home, Gal and I were there and uh, they said, my life is in a mess. It's a continual mess. I've tried everything. I've been to counselling. I've spent three or four months at counselling. My work paid for it, but it's done me no good. I've been to the doctor. He's given me all these pills because I'm so discouraged and so, so down, but they haven't made one ounce of difference. I'm surprised. These things are a sticking plaster what we need is Jesus. This man didn't need somebody to lock him up. This man didn't need secular counselling. This man didn't need drugging up. He needed Jesus. And the ills of this world, there is one answer. Not a new political system, not more money to be thrown at it. They might make a difference. They might help people reform. But we need an inner transformation that Jesus brings. This man was helpless. He couldn't help himself. No one could help him. It reminds me of the person without Christ. We cannot help ourselves. We need Jesus. See, the, the whole problem with secular counselling is that it's, it helps you to help yourself. It looks at the idea that, th that you are the answer to your own problem if you can only think in a different way. But we are not the answer to our own problems. Jesus is the answer to our problems. And this in turn reminds me that whilst we were powerless and helpless, Christ died for the ungodly. While we were still helpless, powerless to provide for our salvation, Christ died for the ungodly. People need help. The help that we need is Jesus. And I want to encourage you that it's not only the unsaved that need Jesus, but for the saved, every answer is Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, here's something to think about. Jesus did, so there's the first take home. The answer is always Jesus. For, for every problem that the world has, for the, every problem that you have, the answer is always Jesus. 
Hallelujah. First take home. Second take home is the fact that, that Jesus cares and went the extra mile for this man at Gadara. Scripture reports that Jesus didn't do anything else for anybody else in Gadara. The only thing that scripture says is that this man cast out the demons from Legion. We've not got to that bit yet, but we'll get there in a moment. He only ministered to this man. He didn't heal anybody else. He didn't deliver anybody else. He didn't teach in the synagogue. He didn't preach on the hillside. He didn't feed the 5,000 or do any other miracle in Gadara. The only thing that he did was minister to this man. And it reminds me of the words of C.S. Lewis, who said this, when he died in the wounded world, he died not for men, but for each man. If each man had been the only man, he would have done no less. The idea being that Jesus went to an extraordinary length to reach just this one man. He battled the storm on the lake. He stood firm against Satan on the lake. He battled through the storm. He ministered to the man. He went all that way just for one person. It reminds me that Jesus went all the way for us. He went the extra mile for you. Hallelujah. Don't you ever think, don't you never think that Jesus doesn't care? There's too many double negatives in there. You know what I mean? What I mean? trying to say Jesus cares he always goes the extra mile he went all the way to the cross for you if Jesus went for the extra mile for this man it's another take home that we can think about and that is shouldn't we go the extra mile for other people shouldn't we battle through the enemy that stops us trying to minister to other people and bring ministry into their lives that set people free. When the enemy stands firm against us, we need to battle through so that we can be the people of God that God has called us to be and that we can minister the freedom to people that God wants us to be, to, to, to uh, minister. Let us not be put off by the enemy standing against us. Let us go the extra mile. Mark 5, 6 to 8, when, Jesus, uh, um, uh, when he saw Jesus from afar off, he ran and worshipped him, and he cried out with a loud voice, and says, what am I to do with you, Jesus, son of most high? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he had said to him, come out the man, unclean spirit. This was a similar reaction to the demon that Jesus met in Mark 1, where, Jesus, where, where J just then a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know you who you are, the Holy One of God. Now, you've got to remember that demons are speaking through legion at this time. And it wasn't the man that was speaking because he was being controlled by the demons. It was the demon speaking. It's unlikely that the man who had been living on the hillside amongst the tombs would know the face of Jesus. So it's the demons that are recognizing Jesus. And it reminds me that demons are not atheists. James 2.19 says this, you believe that there is one God, good. Even the, even the demons believe it and they shudder. They shudder because they feel under threat. Now, the scripture says that the, the man fell down and worshipped Jesus. Now, we just said that the man was under the control of the enemy, and so it was the demons that were worshipping Jesus. Hey, uh, hang on a minute. Is it the demons that are worshipping Jesus? Now, they're not worshipping Jesus in the sense of, hallelujah, Jesus, it's you. I surrender my life to you. They are recognising that he is deity, that he is God. It reminds me of the scripture at Philippians 2.11. It says, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and uh, under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So uh, at one point in time, at the end of time, 
everyone will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. Doesn't mean to say that they all acknowledge him as their personal saviour, but they, they will acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. Even the devil will recognise that, or the demons will recognise that, or the unbelievers will recognise that Jesus is Lord. But only those who have received Jesus Christ as their personal saviour will be saved. Then he asked, what's your name? Now, names are significant in the Bible. Names uh, describe somebody's character. So Jesus is saviour, the one who saves. So throughout the scripture, names have significance. And the demon replies that his name is Legion, for we are many. The Roman Legion uh, uh, contained 6,000 soldiers. So we could infer that this man had 6,000 thousand demons goodness gracious me no wonder he was under such torment now here's the inevitable question how did this man become demon possessed now i could go through a long list of behaviors of how we could invite the enemy a demon into our life so that we are demon possessed. I could list a whole, th whole list of things and say to you, if you do this, if you do that, if you do that, then it's a landing strip for a demon to come and possess you. I'm not gonna do that. Why? Because I know that if I was to go through that list, see, I'm, I, I see, I know you, pastor. Uh, I know that if I was to go through that list, you'd say to yourself, I've done that. I've done that, I've done that, I've done that, I must be demon-possessed. And you go home with condemnation thinking that you're demon-possessed. So I'm not going to go through that list deliberately. And I want to remind you that you, as a believer, are not demon-possessed. You are Holy Spirit-possessed. And so when you gave your life to the Lord, there is no room for any demon. The demons have to go when you gave, gave your life to the Lord. The Holy Spirit came and inhabited your spirit. So if you're here a believer tonight and you say, am I demon possessed? The answer is no, you're Holy Spirit possessed. Hallelujah. The important thing for us to recognize as believers is that we're filled with God's spirit. We're possessed by God, not by demons. And then if you are an unbeliever and you say, well, I've got demons. Have I got demons? Have I, is, is there a, where, where, where have these demons come from or whatever? And uh, I want you to recognize um, that the, for the unbeliever, the question is not how did you get into this mess? Jesus did not ask this man, sit down and, uh, uh, with me and let's write down an inventory of all the occult practices and evil things that you've done and engaged in that's got you here. Jesus told the demons to clear off and the man became a follower of Jesus. You see, so often, uh, and we can discuss this at home groups, cafe groups this week at, uh, at, uh, uh, on, on Tuesday and Thursday, so often when people talk about praying for people with demons, they say, right, okay, well, let's get the pen and paper and let's sit down and uh, let's fill in this checklist of two pages and a ticket. Jesus did not sit down with Legion and say, how did you get this? How did it, where did it come from? Where it came from, where the demons came from and how they entered in his life was not the issue. The issue is that Jesus is the answer. The issue is not what caused it, but the issue is Jesus is the answer. The more you focus on the problem, the more of a problem you will think it is. And that's true for many things. Let's just apply it somewhere else, this, this principle, because you know, sometimes when I 
uh, in a prayer meeting or, or, or something when you're gathered together with a few people and, and you're talking about somebody who is ill. I deliberately do not list everything that is wrong with that person and say, well, so-and-so's fallen over and they've, they, they've broken their leg and, and when they fell over and they broke their leg, they cracked their skull at the same time and did I tell you that they've just had a scan this week and they got cancer and the doctor thinks that they've only got a week to live and, and you think, oh, but praise the Lord, God, God is the healer. And I've gone on, on so much about the problem, magnified the problem, that by the time we've come to pray for them, all the faith has gone. So the answer is not to magnify the problem. Where did it come from? How did you get this demon? But the answer is Jesus. Am I making it too simple? Down at the cafe, we wear these aprons. And kindly, there's some people that do the laundry for us, two people who, who keep them clean for us. And they, they, they go out of the cafe filthy, dirty. They've got gravy down them. They've got um, bacon fat down them. They've got tomato sauce down them. They've got brown sauce down them. They've got soup down them. They've got, goodness knows, coffee grinds down them, tea down them, uh, goodness knows what down them. And when the kind people that do the laundry get home, they don't take them out the laundry basket and say, oh, I wonder what that stain is. I wonder how Ian was so clumsy enough to get that on, on the apron. I wonder where that came from. I wonder, now, is this, is this tomato sauce or is it tomato soup? Or it could be blood. I wonder what it is. They don't sit and analyze how it got there. They just throw it in the washing machine. See what I'm saying? Sometimes we spend so much time analysing how we've got to the place where we are when really the answer is not how we got there, but Jesus. Praise God. Hallelujah. Talk about this, home groups. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding him there near the mountain. So all the demons begged him saying, send us to the swine, then we may enter him. And then at once Jesus gave him them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were two, about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. Why did the demon plead with Jesus that he didn't send them into the abyss? They didn't want to go to the place reserved for them. Why did Jesus honour their request? Number of things. Number one, some say it was because Jesus knew the pigs would run off the cliff and it was punishment to the Jewish owners that shouldn't have been keeping unclean pigs. I don't think that was the reason. That's not Jesus' character. Here's the one I like. He sent the demons into the pigs to demonstrate to the man that he was really free. could see him jump off the hill. Am I really free? Yes, you are. They do, they are. They've gone. And of course, we must not forget that this demonstrates also the power and authority of Jesus. Talk more about this. Our home groups, time's going, deary me. So those who fled the swine, fed the swine, fled, and they told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind. He was sitting and clothed in his right mind. A change on the inside makes a difference on the outside. There's the next take home. A change on the inside makes a difference on the outside. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He met with Jesus and he started giving away. Saul met Jesus on the Damascus road. He met Jesus. He wasn't any longer persecuting Jesus, but he was preaching Jesus. The most hopeless of people who have been tormented by demons can be transformed into beacons for Christ. Their lives can be dragged out of the hole, set on firm ground and changed forever. Hallelujah. You give Jesus your crab apple, he gives you back a golden delicious. You give Jesus your thorn, he'll give you an English rose. You give Jesus your acorn, he will give you a mighty oak. You give Jesus your Jacob, the schemer, he'll give you back an Israel, the prince with God. Give Jesus a Simon, the cursing fisherman, he'll give you back Simon Peter, a mighty preacher. 
You give Jesus your soul, persecute of the church, he'll give you back Paul, a militant missionary uh, apostle. You give your life to Jesus and you'll be amazed at what he can do. Hallelujah. When your life is placed in your hands. And they were afraid and those who saw it told him how it happened to him and how he, how, who, who, who had been demon possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. And they were afraid. Now, this week, this word for afraid isn't awe, um, uh, as in sort of reverent awe. It wasn't that these people were saying, wow, did you just see that? Let's just worship the, God, the Lord now. We're in fear of this, in reverent awe of this man who just cast these demons out. No, it was the word from which we get our English word phobia from in the Greek language. They were afraid. Why were they afraid? Why did they ask Jesus to leave? We've just lost 2,000 pigs. If Jesus hangs around a bit more, who else? Who knows what else we might lose? We might lose some more pigs. It is interesting that the people were more interested in their pigs than they were the man who was set free. People, this is sad, people would rather push Jesus out and carry on as business as usual rather than set people free. Don't cramp our space. Don't, don't, we, we, you're not welcome here, Jesus. You're not good for our business. Don't come and disrupt things. Don't matter that people are set free. We're, we're just happy as we are. Go away. We'll, 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 we'll sort it out amongst ourselves. And again, going back to, to somebody that, that comes to, to my office, they might say, I'm in a messy, I've tried this, I've tried that. The answer is Jesus. Don't want to know. Give me another answer, but Jesus. Jesus is... Jesus is going to cramp my space. Jesus is going to means that I've got to change. Jesus means that, well, change for the better. Because your life can't, your life's not very happy now, is it? Some people would rather carry on as they are. Because the freedom that Jesus brings is inconvenient. It's sad. Let's make sure that what Jesus wants to do in your life is not inconvenient to you. But you'll let him come into your life and set you free and free indeed. Time has gone, one last thing. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but he said, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he's had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all would, uh, and all marveled. I'll finish on this, time's gone. Now you'd have thought that somebody who had been set free in such a dramatic way uh, would have been a good person to take along with Jesus. And Jesus would say, well, you're a, you're, you're a good man that can come up and do some testimony at the end of my preaching and tell everybody how good Jesus, uh, Jesus is and how he can set you free. You'd be, come do that. But Jesus doesn't say that. He says, go and tell your friends what, what Jesus has done, what I have done. Why? And I was thinking about this um, because I believe that the man's testimony is going to be more powerful amongst the people that knew him as he was than people that didn't know him before. So, for example, if Jesus had gone, uh, the man had gone off to, with Jesus to Galilee and he'd stood up at the end of the, uh, of the, uh, of the meeting that Jesus was leading and he says, uh, I was once filled with uh, all these thousands of uh, demons and uh, I lived on a hillside 
uh, and I've been set free. Hallelujah. People said, well, you know, you're a decent fellow now. That's, that's a good, nice little story. Yeah. But then if he goes amongst his friends and says, hey, yeah. and they say, you're that fellow that used to be on the, on the top of the hill, aren't you? That used to run around naked, cutting himself and hollering and hooting and, and, and everybody tied you up in chains and you just broke them and, and, and you lived amongst the tombs. And I, I, Yes, you're right. It's me. It, what has happened to you? Well, I met Jesus and Jesus set me free. Nothing else could work. I was hopeless and helpless. I was depraved and <clears throat> desperate. But you know what? Jesus has set me free. Yeah, God, gracious me. How many years have you been up there? And then the conversation would have gone on and the people would have said, instead of saying, oh, that's a nice story, they'd have stepped back and said, wow. If Jesus can do, it, any, do that for you, then he can do anything for you. And it's a reminder too as well that here's the last take home for us tonight that the best people to witness amongst are those who knew you before you were saved because now they can see the difference and it's a powerful difference that will really speak to their hearts it reminds me of the scripture you will be by witnesses in Jerusalem at home first amongst the people that you know then once you've told everybody that you know, all your friends, then go further afield to Judea, then Samaria, and to the ends of the world. Amen. Okay, so let's have lots of take-homes. Let's think about that as I just sum up. The storm on the lake could well have been caused by Satan as he did not want to see this man set free. The helpless and hopeless state of this man reminds us of our helpless and hopeless state without Jesus. It's not a pill, potion or prison or some kind of program. It's not the priory clinic that we need to go to to address our problems. It's Jesus who is the answer. Jesus was the only person that he ministered to in this region. He went the extra mile to this, for this person because he cared for them. He battled with the enemy because he cared for this person. It reminds us to battle through, go the extra mile for the people that God wants to use us to set free. Jesus goes to extraordinary lengths to help you. Nothing is too much. This man had 6,000 demons. How he got them is not the focus. Jesus, the answer is. It reminds me not to dwell and focus on the problems that we might have and catalogue them out and think how hopeless and desperate we are. But to look to Jesus, the answer. Afterwards, he was sitting clothed in his right mind. It makes us, makes, reminds me that when Jesus makes a difference on the inside, it makes a difference on the outside. The people were more concerned about their pigs and the fact that the man was free. Let's not make the change um, Jesus wants to make in our lives inconvenience. And lastly, our witness starts at home amongst our friends. It's, more, it's most powerful amongst those who know us. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Thank you for listening. Gal, come and uh, lead us in our last song.
Chris is just going to uh, come and share something. Just come and stand in the. Take a seat, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I just want to. I just want to share with you the week me and Caroline have had really this week, because it's one of those weeks when you realise just what's going on and just how important it is. At the start of the week, the biggest problem in mine and Caroline's life was a family that we met in Romania. They had two adults four kids living in a room that's about the size of them pews there put together, all they've got. And the biggest problem was we were looking for a bunk bed for them, but we didn't just want a bunk bed, we wanted a bunk bed with a bunk on top and either a settee underneath or a room, you know, those that fall down like click clacks. So we looked at them, we talked to Kim about them, they came and they were like 400 quid and we're thinking, oh, that's great. So that's how our week started. That's the biggest problem we had in our lives. On Wednesday, our son-in-law was rushed into Barnsley Hospital with a suspected heart attack. Um, he was released the same day, they've put him on medication, he's now got to go and see a specialist, I think they keep my vagina. Then on Saturday, you've all, most of you heard, our daughter came. Serious illness, rushed into Barnsley Hospital, blue light, taken to Sheffield, thought they were going to have to operate. Haven't had, so we're not going to dwell on all of that, but it was pretty bad. We had two choices. You can either run and hide and panic, or you can turn to God. Yeah. And we prayed about it. And we knew right from the start that God's promises are true. Yes. And it's going to be all right. And it's going to be all right, because his word says so. So I want you to know that, like you said, we all have to go through the storms. But we can go through them storms with God. And we can go through those storms because we have the promises of God. And I think somebody said once, not too long ago, that Jesus always goes the extra mile. Yeah. I think somebody said it about half an hour ago. Right, yeah. <laughs> so we came into church tonight with all this going on. And the very first problem that we had, the bunk bed, Danielle came into church tonight came up behind us and said, uh oh, and we have like this bunk bed thing. Would it be any good to you? I'm like, really, a bunk bed? That's fantastic. And she said, well, it's not really a bunk bed. It's like a raised bed yeah. and you can put a settee underneath. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, God has you in his hand yeah. and he'll always go the extra mile to get rid of the little problem you had to start with as well. Amen. Amen. Praise God. 
Thank you, Lord, that you care for us, that you are intimately concerned for every detail of our lives. Father, thank you, Lord, that you want us to live in victory. You want us to live in freedom. You have got so much for us. Help us just to appreciate the goodness and the mercy that you have. Father, help us to remember it's not about who we are, but about who you are. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. We praise you. We give you the glory. Amen. Well, I can see that we're going to have a lot to talk about on groups this week. Um, it's on the 25th and on the 27th, Tuesday the 25th and Thursday the 27th, April, 7 o'clock at Cafe Plus. We'd be uh, delighted to see you there. If you haven't been able to make it this week, we do love you. We've been praying for you and we've not forgotten you. And we hope to see you very, very soon. If you want to call me at home, girl at home, 0184 323 978. Um, my mobile for a text is 0747 277 3243. Info at hvelin.org.uk is my email. Oh, I'm looking forward to seeing you again very soon. Until we do see you again, uh, don't forget that we are blessed, abundantly blessed, blessed by the best. Amen. Thank you for coming. <laughs>